Hi, this is Stephen Haynes from Haynes Fire and Risk Consulting. I'm going to present today Rural Water Supply in the 21st Century Part 2 Needed Fire Flows. In Part 2 of the program, we're going to discuss multiple methods for estimating your needed fire flows, where the needed fire flow is the recommended flow capacity in GPM and the flow duration in minutes or hours that's recommended for structural firefighting based on the type and size of structure. We're also going to discuss deviations between these methods and what these differences mean to the Rural Fire Service. The academics out there could easily show us a dozen to two dozen different methods of estimating the needed fire flow. I'm going to focus on the four most common methods in use out there. Uh, the first will be the National Fire Academy Quick Formula, then NFPA 1142, the Insurance Services Office Guide for Determination of Needed Fire Flow, and finally the International Fire Code, Appendix B. In order to compare the four different methods of calculating the needed fire flow, we're going to take a look at the home shown in this picture. This is a single family dwelling with overall dimensions of about 55 feet across and 33 feet deep. It's two stories tall and has a detached garage of wood frame construction located to the right and slightly behind the house. The separation distance between the buildings is about 28 feet. In order to simplify the presentation, we'll summarize the math during our discussions of the needed fire flow formulas. You'll find detailed slides showing our math and associated references at the end of the presentation. The NFA quick fire flow formula is one of my favorites because it's very easy to apply in the field. You're simply going to calculate the floor area of the building, divide that by three, multiply it by the percentage of involvement, which will give you your GPM recommended for the structure. In this case, we have a 55 by 33 foot building that's two stories tall. Divide that by three times 100, we end up with 1,210 GPM for the building itself or the house. Once we've calculated the NFF for the house, we're going to calculate the NFF per exposure. Each exposure gets 25% of the main building's NFF, so in this case it's 302 gallon per minute per exposure. We have one exposure, which is our garage, so we have 1,210 plus 302 GPM. Brings us to about 1,500 gallon per minute as our needed fire flow for this fire scenario. It's important to keep in mind when applying the National Fire Academy Quick Fire Flow Formula that the NFF not only includes the attack line, but also includes backup line and exposure protection lines. It also assumes that continuous supply is available. Based on the uh, inclusion of the backup and exposure lines, you can assume that your attack lines are typically going to be somewhere in the area about 50 to 70 percent of your NFF when using the NFA Quick Fire Flow Formula. NFPA 1142 is a little more difficult to use because you need a copy of the document sitting in front of you, or at least a summary of it. You're going to need to look a couple of things up. First off, we're going to have to find out what the occupancy class is, which is a 7 for a dwelling. You're going to have to look up the construction class, which is a 1 for wood frame construction. Interesting enough, if the building that we're looking at was an office building, we'd be using a construction factor of 1.5. I'm not sure why they do that, but that's how they do it. Um, the water supply, which is your gallons of water required to be on your assignment, is calculated by taking the volume of the building, dividing it by the occupancy class, multiplying it by your construction class, and in this case multiplying that by 1.5 to add additional water for the exposure issue. Once we do that, we end up with approximately 6,000 gallons being required on the assignment. You're then going to go to a table 4.61 and determine what the GPM requirement is based on this water supply. So we end up with a duration of 6,000 gallon a minute divided by 500 GPM or 12 minutes of flow. So what we're saying is you're going to be able to flow 500 gallons a minute for up to 12 minutes. The WS and WDR of the NFPA 1142 method are defined as being the minimum water supply required for fire control and extinguishment in this structure. Uh, I've got a couple of issues with the way this formula is done and we'll, we'll talk about it later, but one of the interesting things is prior to 2017, the water delivery rate had to be established and continuous within five minutes of the first apparatus arriving on scene. For some reason in 2017, the committee decided that it's now just a minimum of 250 GPM is acceptable with no timing or continuity specified. I think they've essentially said that it's okay to be at ISO 9 and be happy with it. The ISO needed fire flow formula has been around for quite a while. Uh, there's basically two ways you could go about this. For dwellings, it has a simplified table where you uh, look at your dwelling, measure the distance between your buildings, and then you pick your flow rate. In this case, we come up with 1,000 GPM because we have an exposure within 11 to 30 feet of our building. Or you can do it longhand, which requires, requires us to do quite a few calculations. We have to calculate the effective area of the building, 
We have to look up the construction class, the occupancy class. We have to develop an exposure factor, a communication factor, all that to develop a needed fire flow of about 1250 GPM. So the longhand just doesn't really get us much different than the, the shortcut method. The needed fire flow calculated under ISO is the amount of water needed to fight a fire in an individual non-sprinklered building. The schedule really assumes it's a continuous water supply, but if we go to the alternative schedule, you'll see that uh, it's looking for a two-hour duration for tanker shuttles and other operations like that. Uh, one of the interesting things is that the alternative water supply schedule specifies 250 GPM be available within five minutes of arrival and that your flow capacity reach its maximum within 15 minutes of the first piece of equipment arriving on scene. The last method we'll look at is Appendix B to the International Fire Code. Uh, basically in applying this formula we're going to calculate the fire flow calculation area which essentially is the floor area of the building and then we're going to go to the uh, paragraph section on dwellings which basically requires uh, 1000 GPM for one hour for buildings that are equal to or under 3600 square feet and 1750 GPM for two hours for dwellings that are over 3600. We're like right on the cusp here so I'm gonna stick with the 1000 GPM for one hour. It seems a little crazy to go this high for 30 square feet. One of the things to keep in mind, though, is under the IFC, the fire chief has quite a bit of power, and he's actually allowed to increase the required flow for a building up to two times what the code calls for, depending upon what his opinion is of the potential for exposure fires and conflagration. Uh, two quick things about the IFC Appendix B method I want to point out. First, it's rarely ever a mandatory requirement of the code. The appendices or appendices of the code are there for informational purposes only unless they've been adopted by law. The other thing is is that this flow rate is really being called for at a measured residual pressure of 20 psi in the water supply main. So the IFC is actually assuming that you're using a, a fixed water supply and does refer you back to NFPA 1142 where a fixed water supply doesn't exist. So here we're going to summarize the needed fire flow recommendations developed with the various methods. We had 1500 GPM under the National Fire Academy, 500 GPM for 12 minutes under NFPA 1142, 1000 GPM for 2 hours under ISO, and 1000 GPM for 1 hour under the IFC. And I got to tell you, I don't understand why there's such a disparity between NFPA 1142 and all the other methods. The next couple slides here we're going to discuss this. So if we look at NFP 1142, why is it okay to march in with a lower flow rate and less water? Even if we assume that the NFF under 1142 is equal to the attack line flow of the National Fire Academy formula, you got to wonder because you've got no extra flow or operating time to compensate for errors or inefficient stream placement. you got 12 minutes of flow at your, tar at your maximum required flow rate to extinguish a 3,600 square foot home. It's a two-story, 3,600 square foot home, 500 GPM for 12 minutes. I tell you what, you better be on your game or damn lucky that day if you're going to knock that fire out. Uh, the other question you got to ask yourself too is, do homes burn with less intensity than other buildings? If not, why is 1142 reduced the water supply requirement by 50% for a dwelling? You also have to ask yourself, is it safe to march in with a lower flow rate and less water? If the total NFF of 1142 is equal to or less than the attack line, flow of, NFA, of the NFA or the other formulas, uh, the risk of inadequate or interrupted flow has to increase. There's no reserve capacity for backup lines. And what if you get into an IRT deployment? How are you going to support this? I, I hate to say it, but you know, dwelling fires kill and injure more firefighters than any other type of structure out there. We all know that. So why are we accepting a more risky response than we need to? The other question you have to ask, is it fair to the homeowner to march in with a lower flow rate and less water? That's bad enough that the extra response time to get to his property increases the potential for a loss. Then we're going to come in and accept a fraction of the water supply. Uh, what's even worse here is, what if the person also makes part of or all of their living on the same property? It's a farm. They've got their auto shop in the back behind the house. They've got their knitting business or whatever business in the basement. That, that there's a lot of folks out there in the rural environment that make their living and live on the same property. Uh, the answer to this is really no. Unless we've warned them ahead of time, 
and they've done nothing to help you. We're going to talk a lot about that in part seven under developing a water supply improvement program where we need to make sure that people know our weaknesses so that they understand the level of service that they're getting. So why is the NFF of NFPA 1142 so low for dwelling and why have its expectations been made even lower in 2017? In my opinion, this has been done to make it easier for fire departments to say they're in compliance and help them look better, to align the documents' expectations with the limitations of decades or centuries old technology. The other part is because there's organizational cultures out there that really just accept higher losses per fire in rural America as a fact of life that can't be changed. And a lot of times that some of these cultures are more interested in bragging about a weekend tanker drill than acknowledging their limitations and trying to do something about them. So in summary, I'd like you to take away from this conversation that 1142 needs to be looked at as a bare minimum water supply suitable for a quick knockdown. We can't be, or we shouldn't be trying to use it as an end goal to tell, tell people how well we're doing. Uh, the formulas of the NFA, ISO, and IFC provide a much better, more realistic end goal for planning and decision making. And we need to have our operations move as close to an adequate and continuous water supply as quickly and all, quickly and as often as conditions and equipment will allow us to do it. Uh, most I didn't say all the time because we're never going to get there all the time, but as often as we can, we want to move towards an adequate and continuous water supply in order to increase firefighting effectiveness, provide some room for operational errors, and improve the margin of firefighter safety. Uh, at the end of the day, we really need some new water supply methods and technologies to be brought into the rural fire service. It's the only way we're going to get away from these very short duration water supplies and fire attack capabilities and move closer to a continuous or sustained water supply on a more regular basis. I hope you found the presentation useful, thought-provoking, and hope to hear your feedback. My email address and everything else you need there is listed below. Uh, please check back shortly for some additional presentations as we'll be uh, clicking our way through to different parts as we get improved. Uh, the next couple of slides you'll see the detailed uh, calculations for the needed fire flow estimates that we skipped over during the presentation. Take care.